Today, we are very honored to welcome Judge Thomas Bergenthal, easily one of the most distinguished guests ever to speak at our humble program. Mr. Lestini from Words of Music is here today with copies of Judge Bergenthal's memoir, Lucky Child. Uh, they are $13, that includes tax. You will accept cash, check, or charge. If you haven't read it yet, it is a remarkable book and a must read. I want to thank Noel Foreman for making me aware that Judge Bergenthal would be in town to speak at Bethany, from which he graduated. And uh, I invited him and he graciously accepted and we are very happy that he did. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Keep in mind that you will also be appearing at Temple Shalom this evening on Bethany Pike at about 8.15 um, after services which begin at 7. Judge Thomas Bergethal served as the American judge on the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, from 2000 to 2010. Between 1979 and 1991, he was a judge and president of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. In the 1990s, uh, by the way, sit back, get comfortable, because this is a long resume. He was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee and the UN Truth Commission for El Salvador. On his retirement from the ICJ, Judge Bergenthal was named Professor of Comparative Law and Jurisprudence at George Washington University Law School in D.C., a position he held prior to his election to the ICJ. He also serves on the Ethics Commission of the International Olympic Committee. Professional Bergenthal was the Dean of Washington College of Law at American University from 1980 to 85. At different times, he also served as Professor of International Law at the SUNY Buffalo Law School, the University of Texas, Emory University of Law Schools. While at Emory, he was Director of the Human Rights Program of the Carter Center. Judge Bergenthal graduated from Bethany College and the New York University Law School. He received LLM and SJD degrees from the Harvard Law School. He is the recipient of honorary doctorates from various American and European universities, including the American University, George Washington, Free University of Brussels, University of Heidelberg, New York University, Ethnic College, and University of Göttingen. Among his recent awards, he is the, is the 2009 International Justice Prize of the Peter Gruber Foundation. Judge Bergenthal is the author of more than a dozen books and a large number of professional journal articles dealing with international law and human rights subject. His recent memoir, A Lucky Child, which recounts his experiences as one of the youngest survivors of Auschwitz, has been published in 12 languages. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Judge Thomas Berg. Small hotel, maybe to sort of have it for friends. 
Nielsen Network. And when we were all lined up again for another selection of the work camp, the, uh, they pulled all the children up by force from, from the family. I, I was being pulled away from my father. My father held on to me. Uh, and he said, hey, we want to speak to the commandant. And my father had run a workshop for the SS. We were allowed to go, and I went to the to the commandant who was standing there in front, and I said to him in German, in German captain, I can work. And he looked at me, and he said, okay, we'll see. And that's how I ended up one of three children who survived that selection. Actually, the rest of the children were taken to the Jewish cemetery in cancer and killed the pandemic. Uh, well, in that one of the work camps, my father said, "Boy, well, we told him that you can work, so we better try to find a job for you." And the, so I became the errand boy of the commandant of the of the work camp because I spoke uh, German and Polish. Uh, and one of my jobs was to just do errands for him. To, some of the lower ranking German officers would come to visit the ride by bicycle. And I would put the bicycles away. That's how I learned to ride the bicycle. Uh, whenever I afterwards played with my children and tried to teach them how to ride the bicycle, that memory would always come back. And I thought it was really nice that they learned to ride the bicycle in a more civilized way than, than I did. Well, I, I served as, a, as an errand boy, and, and one of the jobs that I performed on my own as a sort of freelancer was I knew whenever the commandant would come, he, go through the, through the factory, he would meet people who were just standing. I would run ahead of him first. He, he wore a hat, with a, with a sort of a Bavarian hat with a feather. I would run ahead of him and go like this. Yeah. <laughs> and people knew He's coming, so I'm going to work very hard. Anyway, I was an experienced Arab boy by the time I came to Auschwitz. Uh, I was still in Auschwitz, as I mentioned, with, with my father. Uh, within two months, my father and I were separated. My father was sent to another camp, and I was uh, taken where I we assumed we were going to the guest chambers. It didn't happen. To find out what happened was to be. <laughs> uh, I then I stayed in Auschwitz until a few days before the uh, Soviet troops arrived. I was on the death march uh, out of Auschwitz, uh, three days of walking in January of 1945. And those of you who know something about polar winters can imagine how cold it was. And all I had was my little prison bar and, and a blanket. When, when I came back in 2000, uh, in the, the same time that the British writer wanted to interview me, I was dressed with everything I had, and I was still freezing. I just wondered, how did I ever make it? Three days of March, and then 10 days of open railroad cars from, Germany, from Poland to Germany, in the winter in the snow, uh, with a thin little black. The only damage I sustained was that I brushed by so my, some of my toes were amputated, which made it always difficult to translate around when they said, how many fingers, how many toes do you have? And that was always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, when we, when we, we the, after the 10 day, railroad car, we ended up in a German concentration camp outside of Berlin called Sachsenhaus. And there my, my toes were amputated. I was liberated there by, by Soviet and Polish troops uh, in April of 1945. Um, we were just, unlike the liberation that was organized by British and American troops, the Soviets simply opened the gates and said, you're free, you can go. Don't go that way there, still fighting, go this way. I didn't know where to go. 
The first thing, of course, we did was to store in the kitchen uh, of the SS. Uh, and the only thing I could eat, and I still to this like it, was I found a pickle. <laughs> and I ate the pickle, which was lucky because people ate and they ate too much. It's a quite a number of people that died. Well, I, uh, on the road out of the camp, I, there, there were Polish soldiers, and I was walking with a, a pole together, and they, they looked at me and they said, You're a pole. And I said, Why not? I'm a pole. <laughs> so they said, Well, we'd like to take you back to Poland. But they made me a mascot of the first Polish. Kershuska Division. And this was a wonderful period. Imagine you liberated from the concentration camp. You become the mascot of the Polish army, of the scout, of the scout company. They liberated a pony for me. They gave me a uniform. There was a uniform in one of the pictures. Even a little woman's gun. And we then, I participated in the Battle of Berlin. I, when I speak about my book in Germany, I always say I liberated Berlin, and <laughs> surprises them. Um, after, when the war ended, the, the Polish troops withdrew to Poland, and I went with them. And not long after that, uh, a Jewish soldier uh, in the Polish army took me to an orphanage. I was in, in, in a Jewish orphanage outside of Warsaw. Um, we were treated very well. There was uh, food that I've never seen, cream, eggs. It shows I ate. <laughs> I should have eaten less during those days. But it was a wonderful transition period with, with a lot of uh, children who had been in hiding in, in Poland. And uh, I just, we just assumed that my parents had, had died. I didn't assume it. It's strange. When I, when I wrote the book, I suddenly sort of started to think, it never occurred to me to look for my parents. I just assumed that they were alive and that they would find them. As a child, you know, I had gone through all of this hell, and I just believed my parents were immortal. They must be alive, and they will find me. So I never bothered uh, looking for them. And then one day, uh, there's a lot of stories in the field. But one day, a letter arrived from my mother. She, she learned that I, that I was in this orphanage. And the way she learned that it is really a miracle when you think about it. Uh, in this orphanage, which was run by a sort of very left uh, Jewish organization uh, who wanted us to become good Polish communists and build up the country. But the orphanage was infiltrated by, by a Zionist youth organization. And one day, the um, counselor who was Zion said to me, uh, would you like to go to Palestine? In those days, it was still Palestine. And I said, why not? I've been every day to go to Palestine. Uh, and she said, well, if you can keep a secret, uh, we, we will, you will run away from here one day when I tell you. You'll be picked up, picked up about two blocks down the road. And then eventually you'll end, end up in Palestine. And I said, well, when can I go? And she said, no, you have to wait uh, until everybody else goes. Because I, since I was the only one who did in, in Auschwitz, the newsreels in, in those days and the newspapers would interview me. So she said, you're the last one, because if you run away now, the whole thing is just going to be blown up. So I, I need to, to wait. But my name was on a list that was sent to the Jewish agency in Palestine. And there somebody sat in an office and looked at the list of a child in an orphanage in Poland and a mother in Germany looking for a child and master. Thousands and thousands of people in those days, hundreds of thousands of people looking for and this is before computers. <laughs> With computers, it would have been easy. And that's how we were reunited. And then I had to be smuggled out of, I had no papers, of course. I had to be smuggled out of Poland to Czechoslovakia to, Germ to the American zone in Germany, then the British zone in Germany, where my mother was. I should say my mother 
and was in Auschwitz. She ended up in Ravensburg. She was liberated outside of Ravensburg on an equal on a death march and, and survived it all. And, uh, and my father did. Why don't I stop here? Talk longer than I should. <laughs> yes, all the way in the back. How did you learn English and under what circumstances did you come to the States? Okay. Uh, when I was reunited with my mother, that was in, in December of 1946. We were separated in 1944. Uh, as soon as I was reunited with my mother, she, she realized that I have to have some education. So, uh, and I have none except for the two months of the, in the orphanage in Poland. Uh, so she hired a, a tutor, and I had one year of private tutoring that ended up in a German high school. I, I covered seven years in, in one, which is always very interesting when I when I tried to persuade my daughters-in-law to send the grandchildren for a week, and they say, well, they're going to miss school. Why do they miss school? <laughs> I well, so you know, I missed seven years of school. It <laughs> made <laughs> much of a difference. <laughs> it never works. It never works. <laughs> so in the high school, uh, I, I had some German and I had French, and I came to the U.S. Um, as a matter of fact, on the ship coming over, it was a, one of the Liberty boats uh, I came over. They, everybody had to work. But since I could speak English in quotation marks, I could serve as an interpreter for German and Polish and make announcements. It was much better work than painting the ship. <laughs> so I, I learned some English. But of course, when I came to high school, then I arrived in the U.S. in 1951. Uh, and, and, and went to high school right in 1952, started, and graduated from high school in, in a year and a half, and ended up in Bethany in 1953. Yes? How did you end up in the Bethany? Ah, <laughs> that's a wonderful story. Did I don't know if they mentioned it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I tell you, you know, with this sort of educational background I had, I, I wanted to go to college. And when I was in high school, they, of course, they had uh, college counselors. And I went to the counselor and I said, uh, I want to go to college. Uh, how do I do that? And where do I go? So she said, well, uh, the best thing for you to do is to go to a small school because that's where you really get acclimated to the U.S. And here is a list of 10 colleges you should go to. I, and, I, and she told me to write for a catalog, and I did that. The catalogs from all 10 schools arrived. I applied to nine of the schools, but not to Bethany. Because when I opened the Bethany catalog, it said, this is a Christian college. And I assumed they didn't want me. <laughs> so I, I didn't fill out the, the form. Uh, and, but all of the other colleges to which I applied, and there were some very fine schools like Hamilton and Colgate, that the whole group of, of good schools. They all said, they admitted me, but they said they had some doubts about my academic background, that they were not sure that I would hack it academically. So uh, they, they would admit me, and if, if at the end of the first year, if I did well, I would get a scholarship. Well, I didn't have enough money to, to go for it for a year. Uh, and, then when I, and then I figured, well, I would work for a year, earn enough money, and, and then go. Then one day, I was called to the counselor's office and was introduced to the dean of students of Bethany College. And the first question he asked was, why didn't you send out your application? And I wasn't so sure, how do you explain this? <laughs> so finally I gave my reason. And he looked at me and he said, young man, this is America. Bethany will welcome you. Just 
together whether you're Jewish or not, and will get you a scholarship and will admit you. I looked at your grades, he said. And that's how I came to that. And I never regret it. I hope you will tell that to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, I followed your career through the Bethany bulletins, and I just think you're the most marvelous person that ever lived. <laughs> Working, I, I, 
I remember as a, as a child uh, being able to go and see the picture uh, doing matches for the pesos. Uh, all of this was still going on. And at the same time, of course, it was just like waiting, waiting for Halloween to, to come to. Yes? I have two burning questions. I'd like, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing your story, <coughs> taking the time to write your book. Um, I, I'm very much interested in post-World War II Germany, and, and you said your mother was in, in Germany. She, I, I imagine she was at a displaced persons no. camp. No? Okay. Can you share a little bit about how you uh, journeyed to your mother? And, and, yes. and, and the second question I have... Oh, because I'm okay. getting old. <laughs> When my mother was liberated, uh, and my, my father and my mother had agreed on different places where they would meet if they survived the war. And one of the places was the ghetto of Kent, was Kent, the city where we were in the ghetto. And that was the first place my mother wanted to go to. But of course she was liberated outside of Ravensburg in Germany. She walked, basically, back to Poland looking for me. And when she got to Poland, cancer, there were some survivors already who were native of cancer, and, and they told her, your husband did not survive. And nobody knew what, what happened to me. Of course, they all said he couldn't possibly be alive. All that you know, they would say, tell her, all of the children died. Uh, she didn't accept that. And incidentally, one reason she didn't accept it is the title of the book. I'm surprised that some of you didn't ask me, why did I choose that title? Uh, when we were waiting for our visas to go to England, a friend of my mother stopped her into going to a fortune teller. And uh, my mother was very young at the time, the fortune teller, she took off her ring, and the fortune teller told her, things are going to be very bad for your family, and then, what's coming, which of course you need a fortune teller to tell you that in 1939 you were doing. <laughs> and then she said, and you have a son. And the son is a good skin, is a lucky child. Nothing is going to happen to you. You'll survive it all. And, and that's what kept my mother going all those years. And everybody said it couldn't possibly be alive. She believed. Afterwards, she said, no, no, I never believed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what sustained She went back to the next place, and to stay with your question. Uh, she went back. Next place was my mother's place of birth in Göttingen, in Germany, in northern Germany. Um, that was where they were supposed to be. And there, she basically collapsed. And stayed there for in the hospital for three months. And then it was looking for me again. All over until she finally found me. The Holocaust Museum in Washington has put together this a pack of about this documents showing the search for me that was going on all over in Palestine. In, in going all the way to Australia, in Poland, all the Red Cross organizations, the British Army, the whole, this is, it was, these documents were found in Matt Aronson, which is a place where all of the documents from the, most of the documents from the concentration camp can be found, and early post-war documents. That, and she was in the middle of it. And she, she stayed there. Waiting for me. Your second question. Uh, my second question is uh, in regards to your writing. I, actually, I'm working on a book about my father, and he uh, survived. Uh, he was in Russia during World War II, and he actually wound up as uh, Zukov's personal barber. And then he went to uh, Germany. Uh, funny thing is that my father also consulted a gypsy in the 30s, and he had a similar experience. But, but they the, must have been paid to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the thing is, as a writer, 
Uh, how uh, did you approach the writing, and how long did it actually take you to write the book, and some of the uh, things that came up during the course of the writing? You know, it was the easiest book I ever wrote. No footnotes. <laughs> no research. You know, as a, as a law professor, you write with a lot of footnotes. That's the only way you get tenure. And, uh, uh, I wrote the, the book in three months, just one summer. Uh, I, I sat down with the computer. And the only research I did was to, I didn't know exactly when I came to Auschwitz. And I didn't know exactly when I was liberated. That's the only thing. I, I should tell you, uh, in trying to find out when I arrived in Auschwitz, we were the first visit that my wife and I did to Auschwitz. I uh, was in 91. And they, they have archives there. And we went to the archives, and I said, uh, this is my name. I, and they said, no, by the time you arrive, and I said, I'm here by the 44, I knew that. So by the time you arrive, they don't know your two names. Give us your number. I gave them my number, and they immediately told me the day in which I came. When I, you know, who was with me, where we came from, everything was there. Just imagine the indignity, and the ultimate. You, you arrived there. If I had died there, all of the people who died in Auschwitz don't exist. Never existed. And I never realized that until, you know, you asked, what did you re realize as, as you were writing the book? That was one thing. And it, it had never occurred to me. Because we were told always the Germans are so good at keeping records. Well, they were good at keeping records, but by the time in 1944, they were losing the war, and they only had time to, to give you another. Um, I thought you would also ask me, and this is a question that's always asked, why did you wait so long? Uh, you know, I, I always knew I was going to write a book. Uh, it was something I was going to write for my, for my children and for my grandchildren. It had to be written. But there were a lot of other things I had to do in life. Uh, so I knew. And then one day I realized I am not immortal. <laughs> and then I sat down and, and wrote it. And as you write it, you know, a lot of things, you know, what struck me too was, for me, the experience was easy in a sense. I, I was a child, grew up in the camps. I didn't know any life before or after. Imagine my parents, what they were thinking about. What's going to happen? They had a beautiful life before. Are we going to survive? What's going to happen to him? Where is he? All of those things. All I thought about, you know, of course I, I miss my parents. But at one point you just think of surviving and eating. You were continuously hungry uh, in the camp. And you were continuously afraid you were going to be sent to the gas chamber. But they, they thought about a lot of other things. It's very difficult. Uh, and as I was beginning to write, it never occurred to me. You know, we just we live our lives. And then none of those things come that, that you think about. Uh, and how hard it, it, it was for my wife, for my, for my mother uh, in the camp. And how hard it was for my father, who always managed to save me. But in this last moment, when we were separated, he couldn't save me. He, because he always figured out what to do. But in this one situation, he thought he'd made a mistake. I, I don't think he made a mistake. I don't think it could have been prevented. But I'm sure he thought he made a mistake. So you have all of this as you write to you think about these things. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Um, sir, at what point did your mother tell you um, what the fortune teller had told her? Did you know that? when you were in the camps, or was this something she told you after you were reunited? I, I'm not sure, but I would think afterwards. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I don't know if you can address this or not, but I've often wondered, not so much in the ghetto, but in Auschwitz, uh, 
were you given the opportunity to bathe, brush your teeth, wash your clothes? Uh, this is something my wife always wonders about. <laughs> <laughs> It, you know, when there was a, a bathhouse in Auschwitz, there was a long barrack with a, a pipe with holes in it, and the rusty water would come out of it, cold water, in, in the winter, in the summer. And that's where you washed. And you weren't allowed to spend very much time there. I don't think I ever washed my clothes. I don't remember if I did. Uh, it was the same in the toilet. It was this long barrack. If any one of you visited it, you were allowed five minutes. And the reason you wanted to stay the longer was because it was the only place that was warm. <laughs> yes, sir. I, I find that podcast just amazing and incredible. I can't conceive of it. It happened in Germany, which was the, the center of culture. And, uh, for the entire world. What is, what is your take on how that world has been about? Did it happen here? Well, I always felt that Germany, that no country has a monopoly on goodness or evil. And it can happen in other places. If you have the right demagogue, the right economic environment, <coughs> the right political environment, <coughs> uh, and some history that plays into it. It all helped Hitler. When you hear it now and you see him now, you say, how does how this, this insane person manage to take a nation that had uh, a Goethe, a Schiller, uh, a Beethoven, all of that, and become... There, there was anti-Semitism in Germany before Hitler. But we always thought if any place would be where it would be Poland or the Ukraine, not the Germany. But I don't think, uh, if, if the conditions are right, things can happen, in my opinion, in, in, in other countries as well. And for, I don't know the, the real reason, there's a lot of economic reasons in Germany after the First World War, the, the inflation, uh, the unemployment, all of this played into <coughs> an unbelievable demagogue with a great minister of, of propaganda, all of this help. Yes, sir. Well, Judge Bush, there was also a very big holocaust in Russia during that period? Well, there, there was, uh, in Russia, you still had the programs much earlier. So actually, when you, when you, when you see American Jews with parents or grandparents who came to the U.S. from the East, uh, they, they ran away from the programs in, in, in Russia, what is now Belarus, Ukraine, and Romania. That's where the where these programs were taking place. But they weren't as organized as the, the Holocaust. The Holocaust, if this was a, a, a extermination business, a factory, a conglomerate that they would manage to do. In Russia, these were the Cossacks would come in, they would kill 100, 150 people, and then life would go on again. But that was not German. It was gradual, very gradually organized. And the world just watched it. I mean, that's the other part, is that the world at that time did not really do very much to, to stop it. There were a lot of reasons why they couldn't. Uh, a lot of Jews could have been saved if American Jews and others had provided the affidavits that were necessary to, to get people out of Germany or Poland. Because in order to get to the US at the time, you had to have an affidavit for somebody who was living in the US who would vouch for the fact that, that they would take care of you if, if you couldn't on your own. My grandparents, at the time they got the affidavits, it was too late. So there was a little blame going to go around all over the place. This one. There's a, a, a question for discussion at the end of the book that both you and your mother did not or do not harbor any anger for what happened. Was there a period in your life when you were very angry at what happened? Yes. There is a, uh, I, I tell the story, when, when I came to Germany, uh, I was reunited 
with my mother. We lived in a place that had a balcony. And on Saturdays and Sundays, the Germans would walk to the countryside with the whole family. And I wished I had a machine gun <laughs> to do what, to them what they did to us. Uh, it took a while to get up with that. Uh, and it was a terrible, I'm ashamed of that feeling. I, uh, I was a 15, 13, 14 year old boy, but it was very strong. I have to show you my, my mother. Uh, she grew up in that town. That, that, she went to high school with a lot of the people. One day she was standing in the street corner and an old lady came to her and said, can you help me across the street? And my mother said, my, nobody helped my mother across the street in this city. And she walked away. For years she had a bad conscience. She said, how could I have done this to this poor woman? What could she have? So we, we all went through this. I have read your book, and it is a very powerful and empowering book. It is outstanding. My question for you is, you saw, you witnessed man, inhumanity of man, and yet you have become a champion of human rights. How did you parlay those two pieces to come out where you are now? Parlay is not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, everybody is drawn to doing something that he believes that should be, that should do. And I was lucky enough uh, that my studies and everything sort of empowered me uh, to follow what I thought was important to do, which was to try to, to have some hand in preventing other people, wherever they live, from suffering the, the same fate that we suffer. And so human rights was sort of a natural, a natural uh, occupation for me. And actually, uh, as, a, as a lawyer, I always felt, and I mentioned it in the book, that I, I had a great advantage over my other human rights lawyer colleagues, because I knew what it felt like to be a victim. Uh, and, you know, so I was drawn to that. Some people say, you know, how can you, after all of this, you go and you investigate some more of this? Uh, the question never occurred to me. It just seemed that you had to do that. Uh, and it, it, it wasn't an obsession. I, I'm not the person who was obsessed with anything, except my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that, otherwise I'm going to <laughs> And it seemed the natural thing for, for me to do, and, and it came naturally. A lot of things, my research, and my, my book led to appointments under the blue. So a lot of these things, you know, students ask me, how do you become a judge? Well, you don't, you don't plan to become a judge. All of these things just happen. You have to be prepared.
out of that discussion. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sensitive question in my country uh, because uh, I would always tell them, you weren't really interested in here because I would, you know, on, on holidays and high holiday Jewish holidays, I would mention things when I when I push the, the when they talk when I talk about how to ride a bicycle or when I saw them drink the money to drink their milk, it would bring out my experience. And I also had the feeling that, that they were in the They would say I, I didn't want to talk to So it, it's uh, on the other hand, when, when I send them the manuscript of, of my book, uh, they said, Oh we, we knew all about that. These are my, my, my children, uh, who are, the oldest is 50 years old, um, who, who incidentally said in an interview once, he said, you, my father always says that he's never sort of been very much involved with thinking about the Holocaust. Don't believe it. <laughs> His entire life, it was there, and then the occasion was he would always bring it up. Now, my grandchildren are very different. They are interested. They even act me out. They have outer egos. If they have a school play, they play. Uh, they're extremely interested. They, they read the book. They write book reviews about it. Uh, and so it, it's wonderful uh, to see. Uh, my, my, my children are a little more reticent. And my wife and I always said there was agreement about that because she, she said she believed that they, they didn't want to ask me a lot of questions because they were afraid. They want to talk about things that hurt them, the pain that I'm saying. I thought they were just not interested. She may, I hope she's right. <laughs> opinion on the continued search for Nazi war criminals like, uh, I think it's Ben Jansig, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, should we continue to do that? Well, let me tell you my, first of all, these people would, would be in their 90s at this point, 89, I think they're just arrested. It's at this point, what good will come of it? On the one hand, people say, well, you at least know, you let people know that they'll never escape punishment regardless. Uh, my, my sense is, sadly, that that's not going to undo the, what happened in, in the camps, the terrible things that happened. So, uh, to put it, bluntly, leaves me cold. And, and, and sometimes I feel it has also a negative effect. Because if you see a 90-year-old man being rolled into a courtroom to who is seen that, uh, the sympathy is on his side. So I, I, I don't really see this uh, of having much value. <coughs> right after the war, that was the time to try to, uh, and, uh, to, to some of them were tried and <coughs> not tried, uh, unfortunately. Yes? Uh, with your long uh, experience of studying the law and your uh, service on the International Court of Justice, etc., how do you feel about a movement among some judges in the United States that in reaching their opinions, they should maybe study European standards and apply them to American law. I'm inherently saying that European standards are superior to American standards. The, the debate is usually a little different. Uh, the argument is that the Supreme Court judges and others should not look to foreign law or international law when, when they decide cases. And that there's the reality is, first of all, international law is the law of the land. That's good American history. It, it's in the Constitution. Uh, so what they mean 
is looking to, to like, what other courts in other worlds, how they deal with certain issues that, that we have. I don't see anything wrong with it. It's, we look, the judges in Pennsylvania or West Virginia, we look to what judges in California did. Doesn't mean that we adopt the law. We are free to see how other lawyers in other countries deal with certain issues. I don't see anything wrong with it. It's enriching. Uh, and, and I just find this whole debate uh, to be childish almost. It, it, it's a political uh, debate that really the, the substance of it is crazy. Hundreds of decisions in India, for example, constitutional law decisions, are based on American due process ideas. A lot of countries have learned from us. There are some things we can learn from other countries, but not everything. But it's, we live in a world that is interdependent. It doesn't hurt to find out how a certain issue is dealt with by a German or a French or a Spanish court. It might happen. Some of them have pioneered, for example, the non-execution of uh, young people under the age of 16 or 18. There's nothing wrong with finding out what the world sentiment is on this subject. So uh, I, I find this debate that it doesn't enrich our judicial process at all. Yes? To bring her question forward, though, from the war criminals, what do you think about places like Iran and Ahmadinejad who basically want to annihilate Israel. And that's a more contemporary... Well, what do you think I think? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, you know, if you go, and you said about the nine-year-old man being wheeled into court, but this is a current issue. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, this is what I mean, that we put the country is not having a monopoly on goodness or evil. You have a demo, and he does what he thinks is going to promote what, what will keep it from power. And I'm not surprised by it. It's sad to see. Uh, I mean, it's not the, and Iran is the only kind. I mean, you see what's happening in, uh, in Libya right now. So it's, this, this, is a, this is the job for, for our grandchildren. Unfortunately, you know, you always think, Second World War is over, nothing is ever going to happen. It happens if you know. You have Rwanda, you have the genocide. And, and the struggle with the teaching is to make sure that never again does not become just a refrain. Yes, sir. I was wondering what part the synagogue had. Your synagogue had at the, in the ghetto and in Auschwitz. Was, there, was that a force there that... I, I'm not sure I understand. The synagogue, the, the church, your church. Oh, that was built afterwards? No. It, was there a presence of the synagogue at Auschwitz and, and in the ghetto? Nothing. Well, in the ghetto there were still the synagogues, yes. In Auschwitz there was I mean, some people prayed, I assume, but there was no organized... Uh, Yes. Do you have any thoughts as to why the Jewish people have, over the millennia, been persecuted? It's a question I keep asking myself every day. But I'm ashamed. I asked my wife the other day that you have this uh, designer, clothing designer in Paris, and we become a great anti Semite. Why? And it happens in countries where there aren't even no Jews. Of course, it's not only Jews that, that, that are the subject. Uh, we, we humans have this wonderful gift and wonderful importation that uh, we somehow need to distinguish ourselves from others and see them as inferior or build and the why and this is uh, typical. And that, you know, the anti-Semitism in Poland and other places was in large measure uh, pushed uh, by, by the Catholic Church, uh, something that the, the, the Pope, the 
Polish folk uh, recognize uh, and dealt with. Uh, but that's not true as, uh, today in many places. It's not a religious phenomenon. It's just there's, there's a whipping boy and everybody understands how we're going. I don't know. And I've learned to, to feel that it's, it's going to be with us. When you got to America, did you ever ask your uncle Eric what he knew, what they knew here in the United States? Because it seems to me that there was so much that was known and so little that was done. Well, you should know that when I came to the United States, if my uncle and aunt who had left Germany in 1938, they were one of the last people to get out, never asked me what happened. <laughs> and today, all of their friends, uh, they lived the Paris and New Jersey at the time. They had sort of their own German Jewish community, which was like a transplant uh, from Berlin and some other places. Uh, they, they didn't speak German because that they, that they spoke terrible English. <laughs> uh, but they didn't. You know, here I was. You think they would ask me what was it like in the ghetto or in the house? It's not. In the school, I, you know, I went to high school in Paris, New Jersey. Nobody asked. It was, it, this sort of interest in it came, came much later. Uh, there was no, no interest whatsoever about Jews, at least the Jews that, that, I, that I was in contact with or in, in the school. Even in, in Bethany, I get now letters from my fellow students who, who say, gee, we wish we'd have known. How, why didn't you tell us? <laughs> we had other things to do than to go around and say, look, where I was during the war. That there seemed to be, what, we were so all preoccupied with making, that uh, that seemed not to be at all. <coughs> yes, ma'am. When you were oh, I'm sorry. Are we in Auschwitz, were you aware of people who were there in the camps or who were in other camps because they were thought to be gay? I didn't have an idea what that was. <laughs> no. Yes, actually, let me get back to that. Just you, something occurred to me. Uh, we had in the, and I don't know when I became aware of them. We we had numbers, and you wore a number. You had a number on your arm here, and and then then you had a, something stitched on you to the number. And there was always a half triangle. And and the Jewish one, I, I don't remember. I think it was yellow. The, the communist one was red. But I think the black one was homosexual. That's how it was done. I'm, I'm not sure about it. So I, I didn't know what that was, but I knew that there were people who had a different uh, color. And there were many of them, most of them were Germans. Yes. Just going back for a moment to the question about uh, pursuing the perpetrators in their old age, are you aware of when that has been done and they've been brought to justice, have they in any way ever expressed remorse if they remain defiant in the end? You, you never hear that. I, I should tell you, I, I was, you, heard, you heard, I was a member of the uh, Truth Commission, the United Nations Truth Commission for El Salvador. So we were investigating the terrible things that happened there during the Civil War in El Salvador. Uh, and we, we interrogated and interviewed the people that we knew had committed all of these crimes. Never once did one of them say, I'm sorry, it's terrible. They would always say it was an error, a mistake. And they never understood that. It was just so easy to say, that they never thought of it, that they did something terrible for which they should have thought of it. It was a mistake. Well, we make a mistake, you know. So, but I, I have to remember where you have this as a family. In Germany, particularly, you have a lot of grandchildren and great grandchildren of the perpetrators. 
who read the books about how terrible it is to have a grandfather who's a murderer, who was known to be tortured, who was tagged, who was telling Rabbi today at lunch about a book that is called Silence Hurts. And this woman was describing what it was like to live in a family knowing that her grandfather was executed. It's not very visible on yes. our You want to see it? Yes, why not? I always have to do it when I, my, my law students always want to see it. Oh, I'm attached here. Um, I don't know whether you'll be able to see it all the way in the back. And it's 29, it's E2930. Now I should tell you, those of us who arrived in Auschwitz when I lived in 1944, the number here, uh, the early ones, if you see a number from Auschwitz here, you'll see that there's somebody who arrived in 1943. Not many people survived who arrived in Earth. But by the time we arrived, the numbers, they run out of numbers. So they gave categories. So this is B2930. My mother had A. The women's they the numbers My father, 2931, he was coming right behind me when they had the arm tattoo. I used to use it as a, should I say? <laughs> you know, not that person you can. As my passport. <laughs> But my kids said, once the book is out, you can't do that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did, did you comment that the books don't sell in Germany or they don't have German writers about the Holocaust? The book sells immensely. Pardon? It sells, it, it sells immensely. Uh, in, in Germany, the, the book was on the bestseller list here a number of weeks. Uh, it's, it's gone from hardcover to paperback to audio, uh, and, and it's still selling, and my publisher said it's selling about 200 to 400 copies uh, a month. And interestingly enough, in Sweden, and I can't quite uh, understand it, in, in Sweden it's almost the same thing. In Sweden they even just published a, a book with larger letters. <laughs> Sweden, some people say the reason maybe that they did not take part in the war. They were accused of having uh, provided steel to the Germans and, and other things. But the, the young people in Sweden are impressive. When I was in The Hague, I, I had delegations of Swedish high school kids wanting to come and meet with Also German students. Uh, the, the book is, is uh, also doing very well in, in Spain. Because uh, we think again, the Franco experience mm -hmm. in, in Spain. It, it's not doing well in Norway, but one would have expected it because of the person who saved my life. Uh, it, it's not doing well there. I mean, it's doing that the publisher is not happy with it. Uh, it it's, it's fascinating to see. I've learned a lot about the publishing business. It's too late for me now. <laughs> said when the Russians liberated you, they told you to leave. They said you can go. That wasn't the case with American troops. No. American troops had orders to keep them there. Hot let them out. You would get hospital units up there to get watered down food for them. You would take them out a few at a time, bathe them, destroy their clothing, and give them new clothing. Now, I don't know how, how that worked out. No, no, it was very, that's what I meant you know, when I indicated. We were liberated, but all they did was to just say you're free. And many people died who just over eight when, when they were done. The American and the British troops provided doctors and uh, the Soviets didn't. My unit uh, liberated football. That's where my brother Your father was there? He died. And of course, the orders were nobody was to come out. 
two of my men came back with a 15 year old Polish girl, which was against all rules. But my colonel said, it's all right, just keep it quiet. And uh, I think the third day after they were liberated, one of my men said, he had turned, had taken a ring from him and some other items. I think the ring his mother had given him. So I asked my colonel, could I take him back? And he said, have you been there? And I said, no. He said, well, you take him. I'm going up this afternoon to see it myself. So I took him back. I did not go in the camp. All I had to do was smell it and see the bodies piled up like corpses. My father died in January of 1945. In Guggenwald. We thought, we, we, some, I know some of you had the hardcover of the book, and some of them you had the, the paperback. When I wrote the hardcover, I, I still thought that we were told that my father died in Boston. And it was only a year ago, a year and a half ago, that we found out that he died in the book. Well, he was sent, uh, this is the most unbelievable thing. He was sent from Auschwitz when we were separated to Sachsenhausen, where I came later on. If he had stayed there, we would have been reunited. And then from there, he was sent to Buchwald and he died. And we have, again, we talked about the Germans. In January of 1945, the German doctor in that camp still signed death certificates. And we have a page and a half death certificate but my father's double uh, uh, lung infection. How many did they have <coughs> for care? We were told to expect five to 10,000 to put them all. But you see, out there were like 21,000. Yes, but you, you have to remember one thing, that in our, when I was in Luxembourg, when I was liberated, I was one of the people who stayed behind because I could barely walk. But there was a death march. They tried to still get people out, out of the camp as the Russians were advancing. So the, 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 the Sachsenhausen that was liberated had no more than maybe 200 people. The others who were then liberated, the, the thousand were still marching. When they came back with this boy, I really got upset. But that was the order. Nobody was to leave. But then I met the boy. I changed my idea. Yeah. No, it would have been uh, much better to be liberated by the U.S. by the U.S. Army or, or the British Army uh, than what we were. But at least we were alive. The, the, the Russians came in and they said, "Boy, na kaput," which is war is over. War, war is how kaput, sort of a universal term for the end. Uh, you know. I think we should have any questions that we still have asked. Yes, ma'am, all the way in the back. My husband's family lives outside Kelset, so I was just wondering if you managed when you were last in Poland to go back to that meeting point that you were supposed to see your family. Yes, we did. We did, and uh, it was a very know, sad experience of coming two miles. Um, describe it a little bit for you. Uh, we, we were, what we decided to do in, in 91, my mother had just died, and we decided to go every place where I'd been during the war. We had been mapped in the book, and, and of course, Kelsa was one place where so we, we drove it. Um, one part which is interesting, uh, which I still don't understand, uh, I am one of those people who never knows where he's going. <laughs> just get lost. Uh, you know, the kids would say, is it left or right? I would say left. I'd say, let's go left. <laughs> <laughs> we, we drive it and my, my wife says, uh, how do we find the old ghetto? And I say, you have to go this way and that way. And, and then we were two blocks away. And while we were driving up, 
I suddenly remembered the name of the street where I was in the ghetto. Uh, and remember the name of the, of the camp commandant. There is now actually, um, just about a because my husband goes and I go off to school, and then there is now a new museum in Kentucky. Well, if there was, then that was one thing that we, we wanted to find out. There were 25,000 almost Jews who died, and there was nothing. I went to the museum, there is a Polish museum, and, and there was no plaque for the ghetto. I think there probably is now. Probably. There probably is. Do you still well, it's high time. We were there in 91. Yeah. Yeah. I was there in, uh, my husband was there in June, so. Yeah. Well, I was told that the only place where there was a plaque was on the Jewish cemetery, and I couldn't, I didn't have the strength to go to see it. That's where the children were killed. But there was no indication any place in Kelsey. And when you went to the museum, I was handed the book about the Jewish, pre-war Jewish community in Kent. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that something is happening there. <laughs>